This week, Michael and I interview Steve Tout and Stan Bonev from Veraclouds. We're going to talk about all kinds of like money stuff, and then after the money stuff, a great tip for startups. Uh, it's a company that came across my radar. And of course, we'll, of course, we'll talk about the two big acquisitions that happened this week. Uh, CA Technologies acquired Veracode and Okta acquired uh, Stormpath. So, uh, Aqua hired. Aqua hired? We'll yeah, talk. I got to tell you, when, when you dig into this, it's crazy. All right. Well, it's going to be crazy on this edition of Startup Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Brought to you by from a website, an external presence, employees, an office. Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending these assets? Have you penetration tested these public assets? Start 2017 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. In control of cyber risk with Tenable IO, the first vulnerability management platform built for today's elastic assets like cloud, containers, and web apps. Discover a fresh asset-based approach that prioritizes vulnerabilities while seamlessly integrating into your environment. And improve ROI with the first elastic licensing approach based on assets, not IP addresses. Tenable IO delivers the data and context you need to secure your elastic attack surface. Start your free Tenable IO trial today by visiting tenable.io. Algorithms Netmon Freemium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. Netmon Freemium is a free commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use Netmon Freemium's powerful capabilities to search against all observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. Welcome to Startup Security Weekly, episode 30. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, for March 10th, 2017, broadcasting live from a very snowy G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Well, it's, it's somewhat snowy. Apparently more snow <laughs> next week. Yay for March in New England. On the lines via Skype, Michael Santarcangelo joins us from a place where it's probably not snowing. <laughs> I'm not going to point out that it's 76 degrees, and uh, uh, after this, we're going to go hang out at the playground. I, that sounds cruel, so I will I will not do that to you. We hung out at the playground this winter. It was cold. <laughs> Didn't last too long. <laughs> we do. We try and, like, let's get the kids out. We get out of the car. We're like, all right, everyone back in the car. It's really cold. A <laughs> uh, couple of quick announcements before we get started. We're excited to be attending and covering the 13th Annual Secure World Boston Conference, March 22nd and the 23rd at the Heinz Convention Center in Boston. Uh, Secure World brings together New England's cybersecurity community for high-quality training, collaboration, and networking. This year's theme is Surviving the Siege, Medieval Lessons in Modern Security. Don't miss presentations from Larry Wilson, Esmond Kane, Sandy Backick, and many more. Earn 12 to 16 CPAE credits, and Security Weekly listeners get $100 off the registration by going to secureworldexpo.com and using the discount code Security Weekly. IT Pro TV's courses now include Exchange 2016, Wireshark, ECIH, and ECES. IT Pro TV is introducing new membership levels soon. The new standard level is $57 a month or $570 a year and includes access to the on demand courses library, live chat, and the QA forum. The new premium level is $85.70 per month or $857 per year and includes access to all standard membership features and transcender practice exams, virtual labs, and access to the enterprise portal. Subscribers can download courses with annual standard or premium memberships. Michael, I'm going to turn it back over to you to introduce our very special guests for today. <coughs> We've got Steve and Stan from Veraclouds. Th this is going to be fun, uh, and and we'll we'll let them get into it. But it's kind of interesting because 
when you start to look at some of the problems that we can solve, it's really starting to get exciting. Um, and, and I got to tell you, I mean, I know there's a lot of negativity in security today, but I don't see it because I'm out talking to people, solving problems, and taking a look at it. And what's really kind of cool about this is Stan's the, one of the co-founders. Steve just got appointed the CEO. They have a platform. Uh, they have something that can be on-premise or in a cloud. I mean, Paul, all the stuff we've talked about, I mean, this is episode number 30. We've we've uh, we've got a lot of this in this interview, and uh, I spent some time talking to them yesterday to prepare. So it's exciting stuff. So with that, Steve, Stan, welcome uh, to Startup Security Weekly. And, you know, I would love for you to quickly give us some of the history of how you guys got started and then talk a little bit about some of the problems that you solve, and then we'll jump into it from there and explore it a little bit better. Good starting point. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Michael, uh, for us on the show. Uh, I'm going to uh, let Stan give the introduction in the background about Vericlouds, and we can go from there. So, Stan? Uh, thank you, Steve. Thanks, Michael. Good to be here. Um, so, Vericlouds, let me see how to where to start. We started the company uh, in 2014. At that time, about myself and my partner, uh, Rui Wang, we were at Microsoft. I was uh, working at Outlook.com. Uh, as a, a program manager, and he was working as a security researcher at Microsoft Research. And uh, we had a big problem on our plate that um, there were a lot of attacks uh, to Outlook.com that were uh, by um, attackers reusing credentials from uh, different uh, from leaks or those that uh, they were able to get from the dark web. So they were getting those credentials, they were trying them against uh, Outlook, and it was uh, very difficult to detect that uh, those, uh, uh, th those attacks, because as you know, most of the authentication systems, uh, they collect uh, username and password, then they look at uh, uh, some metadata, including the IP, uh, they probably uh, uh, compare against the um, uh, the health of that IP, if it is blacklisted or not, and some historical data, which all of this information, this is not sufficient. And um, it is difficult uh, for a company to be able to detect uh, attacks when the username and the password uh, actually match. And um, it was difficult for, it was difficult for, um, and still it is difficult for many companies and what we were trying to, uh, to look at with my partner is how can we fix this situation? And uh, my partner, he was a security researcher at uh, Microsoft Research who was looking at the other, the other aspect. I was looking from the product uh, point of view, he was looking from the attacker point of view. And um, the solution that we found and that uh, we decided to uh, start uh, working on was a solution that that was very simple. Uh, pretty much it, it was uh, do whatever the sophisticated attackers do. Compile the same type of data, allow companies to compare their own credentials against what the attackers uh, have in their uh, data repositories, and then uh, do all of this in a way that is a secure way, that is in line with uh, all of the legal practices and all of the compliance practices basically do whatever the attackers are doing, offer these to companies and do it in a, a way that uh, enterprises can uh, can adopt. So this is in, in the nutshell uh, how, how we started. One of, one of the things that, that I've noticed about this uh, technology is, uh, you know, different strokes for different folks. I think it works great if you're trying to protect the employees of your organization. How do you guys handle when you're an organization that has customers that you want to protect. And their customer accounts can be like anywhere of any email address, but for a financial institution, let's say, they want to make sure their customers aren't getting compromised somehow. Um, so our, our product uh, works also for customers. As long as the company uh, has an email that they uh, have uh, validly uh, obtained, they can uh, check or compare this email against our data repository. It can be an email of an employee, email of a partner, it can be an email of, of end customer or individual. 
Awesome. Awesome. Um, so how, how did you guys get, uh, started, uh, in terms of like your funding and, and growing the business? I mean, first, uh, we started with a minimum viable product. We wanted to see if, um, we actually started talking to a lot of companies first. We, uh, we tested the different uh, hypotheses, what, what works and what doesn't. And the idea was that uh, we wanted to make sure that the problem we found is something that, that is really a burning need for, for companies. Because as a small company, this is one of the things that we realized along the way uh, by trying different things. If you are not um, solving a really burning issue for a company, even though um, you might think that this is a good idea, that this is something that can help a company, Unless it is really something critical, it will be very difficult for a small company to be able to penetrate uh, into uh, the enterprise. Yeah, I d- uh, absolutely. I, I, I agree. You, so I think to shorten your sales cycle and, and generate interest, especially if you're bootstrapping or, or just getting to MVP, you know, solving that burning issue is, uh, is critical. Um, how do you then uh, pivot from there? Like, is your goal to just keep solving that burning problem? Or in your growth path, are you like, well, that's our foot in the door, but now with our technology, we can solve these other problems. Like, where's your, where's your path for, for growth? Yes, so this is exactly the way how we are thinking about it. We wanted to <clears throat> become the company that solves in the best possible way, in, in the most secure way, uh, account takeover attacks. We spent a lot of time, uh, engineering effort. Also, we spent a lot of effort on the legal side to make sure that what offer is something that complies with uh, all uh, regulations. And um, then after we feel that we, we built something that is uh, probably the best service out there on the market that solves that problem, then uh, the next uh, the next step would be to get to the next round of investment and from there to um, start building uh, the uh, the stack and to expand our platform and look look for different challenges that that we can solve and here of course the idea w- would be um, to find uh, challenges that we can solve uh, differently and that we can solve them better. So look, you know, my perspective on this is that if you're going to start a business, uh, you want to address a problem that's big enough where you can grow a company uh, that's going to be viable uh, in the long run to return uh, value to the shareholders and also uh, to grow profits. Uh, So this is a billion man problem. In fact, it's a greater than a billion man problem. No company is immune to the potential of um, uh, account takeover attacks or uh, data breaches. Uh, We've seen Yahoo in the man, in the in the news of late, where more than 500 million uh, users have been uh, stolen. In fact, more than that. And so, uh, you know, those accounts and, and other data breaches are yielding uh, a lot of tools and uh, um, data that attackers can use uh, to go hack into uh, uh, customers' health systems or bank financial systems or. When you look at the uh, data breach at the OPM, for example, the Office of Personnel Management, there was a, a lot of personal information, a person's financial history, links to their families uh, that are now vis- visible and they're vulnerable as a result of this. So no company is immune to this. Gartner suggests this year we're going to be spending $75 billion on IT security. Uh, this is one of the fastest growing markets that, that we could uh, be involved in right now. Next year, we could be spending $80 billion. So the reality is that data breaches are growing in number and in volume um, that far exceed our ability to invest into this problem. And another concern that I have is that I, you know just throwing money at this problem isn't really addressing the issue. So, you know, my feeling and and the conversations that I have with Stan and the team are that we need to bring a more effective solution to the marketplace, in which case, when when you have a database of uh, um, uh, leaked credentials or or, uh, compromised account data, uh, the size that we do, 
um, we can cover a, a lot of ground quickly and at the same time uh, really minimize uh, uh, false positives from occurring uh, because there's almost a 100%, 100% degree certainty uh, when a user is logging in or if we uh, assess risk on a user as a result of, the, of a data breach that, uh, you know, that user's data is breached, right? And a company needs to look at what actions they need to take, uh, whether it's uh, forcing them to um, to enter in their one-time password with a uh, two-factor authentication, of course, forcing them to change their password or removing them from a from an access group of more sensitive information until there could be an assessment of of a, a risk or an investigation. So this is a very big problem. Uh, last year, you know, it's reported almost you know a billion identities were stolen from various websites. Uh, there's a recent report out that 2020, uh, there's going to be um, you know 300 billion passwords at risk uh, from users uh, data uh, to IOT and devices that uh, presents a very big problem uh, puts puts a lot of sensitive data at risk and we you know I, I feel like uh, we need better more effective solutions not more expensive ones. Um, so when you're in the, the sales process, what did you learn kind of early on? Were some of your challenges in terms of uh, opposition to adopting this technology and how did you overcome them? Yeah, so, I, you know, in, this, um, in the sales process, there's, uh, you know, uh, certainly a degree of awareness uh, that needs to be, uh, that, that we need to, to have uh, with customers. Uh, you know, we were just talking to a CISO uh, at one of the largest growing uh, Silicon Valley companies. And he understands the problem, right, uh, very well. Uh, but there are some challenges and some nuances to taking the approach that we have and going and selling this directly uh, on, on behalf of in customers. And one of them is privacy. So it raises the question, wow, you just notified me that uh, you, you know what my password is or that it matches uh, with a password that I've used in a SaaS service, what else do you know about me? So, you know, th 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 there's this uh, obje objection that we need to get around, which is, do we just go and, and bluntly apply this uh, detective capability to all users within our, our community, or do we need to be sensitive around um, uh, a user's privacy and have them opt into enhanced protection and maybe even pay a fee for the enhanced protection. So um, we're seeing different perspectives. We're really listening to the concerns that um, uh, our, our customers and, and um, uh, you know CISOs and others uh, have out there in the community and, and uh, hopefully addressing them through our, our channel partner where uh, you know, we don't just solve the problem with blunt force. We can use precision and even opt-in techniques to pr protect uh, end users' privacy and offer a consent model where, where we extend the uh, protection through the solution. Yeah, I, I've, uh, I've often found that with solutions like this, sometimes it's really easy to prove your value because you guys can go run the tool and then give them a sample of data and say, well, you know, you know these accounts are compromised, right? Uh, <laughs> that tends to be very compelling uh, for people. Of course, it's tough if the company doesn't have that. That's actually a good thing, but it's hard to show, you know, the diligence has been performed or the value if, you know, there's nothing on there. And a lot of companies I talk, not a lot, but some companies I talk to are like, yeah, we did some kind of dark web monitoring or whatever. And they're like, well, they didn't find anything about us, so we don't see the value in the service. And I, but, I think that can be a tough thing. That is value in itself, right? That's, you, you yeah. know. No, I agree. You know. Uh, returning, returning a query and saying, no, nothing found about you is just as valuable as saying, hey, yeah, we found this cache of data and we're going to need to go take action. And right. there's value in knowing, I, I would love to and, and hope that there's nothing out there about me on the dark web. Um, you know, what price would I be willing to pay on that? I, I would love to know, right? So on a personal level, uh, I, I do see the value, uh, you know, but coming at this, you know, just in terms of uh, presenting the value uh, it, that more has to be done. We, you know, we, we can't go out there holding uh, this data ransom. You know, we differentiate ourselves because we're uh, we're an ethical company. Uh, we would consider ourselves, you know, white hat, uh, you know, data scientists, if you will, uh, with the intention of uh, doing good for humanity and, and uh, improving the security posture and confidence uh, of our customers in the industry at large.
Well, you know there what I think is interesting too is is that when you when you listen to this, like I, I made a pretty simple mistake uh, talking to you guys yesterday when I said you know something along the lines of oh that's kind of neat because you guys are playing on identity in cloud and you're like yeah not really and I was like oh, okay and you're like <laughs> actually we're more like threat and tell uh, and I was like well that's it that's interesting because what and again if if I've mischaracterized this then certainly correct it but what I kind of took away from our conversation yesterday was so you're actually you've niched down threat and tell to say we focus on this aspect because it's important because it's actionable because it's something you need and for me i kind of looked at it and went wow so this whole nebulous threat and tell field that nobody really seems to understand yet you just showed me something that's really specific that i can get my head around um and i i think it's kind of compelling what I'm curious then is that who does that mean you sell to? Like, are you selling to security people or to operations people, or is is it a little different every time? And did I get that right? Explaining that. Yeah, um, Michael, I think you got that right. Uh, there are a couple of companies that that uh, you know have made public statements about how they're using similar solutions internally. Uh, one of them is a large um, uh, storage as a service company in the in the Bay Area. Another one of them is, a, is one of the world's largest, probably the world's largest software company based in Redmond. And, you know, they've already proven that uh, applying this data science to uh, leveraging uh, um, compromised credentials uh, has a pretty good return on investment. So when uh, said large enterprise software company has uh, a 5% success rate, you know, you're talking 5% success on on hundreds of millions of users, if not billions of users in their in their environment, that they're able to proactively uh, detect risk and uh, integrate that with their uh, protective and corrective controls uh, before that data can fall into the hands of a, a hacker or um, a, a potential threat actor to uh, take advantage of uh, that data. So, uh, you know, we are selling really to the technology companies. Uh, you know, we're being a channel oriented company. Uh, we're not selling to the end customers. We're relying on um, our partners and other technology companies to take this data, to take this threat intelligence, and actually integrate it into automated responses uh, in in identity and access management systems on premise or uh, IDAS uh, services such as you know Okta or Centrify, we see that as a huge opportunity uh, because we have a relatively a very small team. We don't have the same resources that these large companies have, so you know we're focused just on the detection, uh, uh, pr protective and, and corrective controls can manifest themselves in, in a dozen different ways. And we're going to leave that up to our uh, technology partners and our integrators uh, to help, you know, provide the appropriate solution. Steve, I, I, I think that's a really smart move, by the way. I think yeah. you're perfectly positioned. And I, I love the solution in this in this type of play um, because I think it, it has to be automated and I think it provides a tremendous amount of value when we start combining uh, intelligence with something that you can take action on, right? We're taking that intelligence and saying, hey, your user is potentially bad or user is like like a high potential for bad. And you know what? We're just going to suspend their access as a result. To me, that's where security really needs to go. My question for you, though, is as a startup, it can be daunting to look at all of the possible integrations and then make the connections to get those integrations. How did you approach the problem of, like, did you just pick up the phone and call Centrify and be like, hey, you should integrate with us. We're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, fortunately for me, I've been in the uh, identity and access management space for, for well over a decade. And I've, I've uh, you know, known a lot of the guys just bumping into them at industry conferences. Um, so, you, you know, it, it was as easy as just picking up the phone or sending an email and mm -hmm. inviting them to coffee or inviting them to um uh, you know, to a meeting to, you know, you know, look at the offering that we have. Um, you know, the thing that differentiates us is that, you know, there, there are companies that do talk about, um, you know, having capabilities to address and monitor stolen credentials. The thing is, is that we are 100% focused, obsessed rather, on solving this problem better than anybody else on the planet. So, uh, you know, while it might be safer to go, 
you know, look at one of our larger competitors that have been more established for, for three to five years. Uh, you know, when it comes to, to uh, compromise credentials in this space, we're going to have larger data sets that are commercially available for uh, the technology companies to integrate. Uh, we're going to have an SLA. We're going to have more frequent updates to our data sets. And, you know, you know I, I think... I want to... I just... <clears throat> Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, just, Stan. Let me just, oh, I just want to yes. make a quick statement because I, I, I'm, I'm loving this. I'm loving listening to you guys because, and this is something I think a lot of startups miss. You guys found a very specific niche that's very easy to understand. And, and as I'm listening to you, though, think about all the things that, that exist around that. That's absolutely fascinating. Like, you guys have given me so much to think about that I didn't even know I needed to think about. And, and by focusing down so tightly, you you guys have created a tremendous amount of opportunity. So, so I I'm, I just wanted to share that excitement as I'm listening to you because it's like, <laughs> holy crap! Like because because I, I gotta imagine somebody looks at you guys and goes, well, I mean, there's already have I been pwned? I mean, can I just check this? And aside from the yeah. manual side of it, you're like, yeah, but what about this? And what about this? And what about? And it's like, oh, that's it's kind of awesome. We're not a one-trick pony. It gets even better, Michael. So uh, I want Stan to share a little bit about the uh, the employee uh, account protection that we have in the uh, uh, intelligent uh, data graph. Uh, so it's not just about uh, protecting employee accounts. Um, Stan, why don't you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so the way how we think with uh, uh, compromised credentials data, this is just the starting point. For example, what uh, we have done is on the top of, the, of that data, we built another layer of data that is contextual data about each of the uh, people with compromised credentials. So now we can tell uh, where they work. We can tell if they have leaked credentials uh, in their personal accounts. And this is this is actually uh, important because if you think of uh, protecting the employee accounts of uh, a certain company, um, you know that many users are using passwords between uh, corporate and personal services. And if we are able to tell that company that uh, their employee has uh, leaked credentials uh, from their personal service or from another company-related service, this can be this can be a big benefit. And um, the other the other thing that is very important that I'm not sure that we mentioned uh, over here was that uh, what we do is we compare credentials, and when we compare credentials, we return the result which credentials have been leaked. So there is no guessing. We are not trying to guess that this person has a leaked credential and the password might or might not be working for uh, your service. No, we just say, yes, this is the, um, this is the password that we have for, the, for that service. And if it matches, uh, the company should consider that particular leaked password as a single vulnerability. And if they have more than one, they should consider that as more than one vulnerabilities that they have. So going back to the um, intelligent, we call it uh, intelligent security uh, graph. The intelligent security graph helps us understand really who is, who is the victim. Because in many cases, the leaked credentials, they're just uh, uh, email or, or a username in, in most cases and a password. And from there, you cannot derive a lot of information. But when you add the contextual data on the top of that, now you have, uh, you have a data graph that, uh, that can tell you a lot more and that can help a company a, a lot more. And another example how this data can be used is if you, if you are able to connect the leaked credentials data with all of the log data from the SIM, in this case, what you can do is you can start uh, your investigation from, from that data. If you see, I'll give you a specific example, something that, that, that we currently do. If you see that um, uh, a large number of uh, leaked credentials uh, from your employees are communicating with an IP, which is not uh, on your blacklist, then uh, in many cases, what we have seen so far, this means that you have uh, a, a malicious uh, user or you have a malicious server that is already 
uh, communicating or have uh, already overtaken some of your uh, company's uh, accounts. And what you can do is you can not only find out that uh, there is a new threat or a new attack vector, but after that, based on that new IP that you discovered based on the leaked credentials, you can see if there are other employees who are, who are not in our database who also communicate with that IP. So in this case, you might be able to uh, unravel uh, a whole attack that is going on in your organization. So my my point was Paul. My point was that um, just having click credentials data is is um, not really the core of the business. This is just the starting point, and when you layer over um, different types of additional data and try to solve different use cases, as you pointed out, employees, uh, partners, um, end users, then uh, this service becomes a lot more interesting. Yeah, no, I I love the approach. I think it's I think it's really solid. Michael, do you have more questions for our guests? Well, I, I'm I am a little bit interested because this is one of the first times we've talked to somebody. So, Steve, uh, congratulations! You were uh, appointed the CEO like five days ago. Uh, so, thank obviously, you. thank you both for joining us on the show. What's that like uh, stepping in in as the CEO? I mean, first five days. I imagine you're on a bit of a whirlwind. Um, any big lessons learned from the process? You know, it's uh, it has been five days, uh, but to be honest, I've been working with this company uh, for almost a year uh, in my in my uh, consulting company that I that I run uh, prior to Vericlouds. Uh, uh, Vericlouds was one of my first customers. Uh, we've enjoyed an excellent, productive uh, working relationship for almost a year. I thought I was either going to get fired or I was going to get tired of working with these guys. Uh, but but the more that I see how how uh, unique and, and valuable the approach is that they're developing uh, to market, it's uh, almost irresistible to to uh, back away from from the opportunities. So look, Michael, you know, the thing is, is I, I, I do know a lot of uh, uh, leaders and, and, and folks in the identity and access management industry. And uh, during the RSA week about uh, almost, I guess, a month ago now, uh, I scheduled a 30 minute meeting with a former colleague of mine, um, also at a very large identity and access management company. As you know, traffic is really, really bad, uh, especially at RSA uh, in that vicinity. Uh, it Because of that, uh, my 30-minute meeting was compressed into 10 minutes uh, over coffee. Um, my uh, colleague asked, uh, Steve, how the heck have you been? It's been a year. We should get together more often. Uh, his second question was, tell me about this fair clouds that you're working with. So clearly he had already heard a, you know, a little bit or enough about it to be interested. Uh, the feedback that I'm getting about the, the, the uh, value, uh, the unique value that their clouds has developed is overwhelmingly positive. And it, it was easy for me. And I, I just I, I had to get more involved and get more skin in the game because uh, I, I could um, uh, help them bring this to market and also help these other companies that have real needs, right? So that's almost made my job really easy, but at the same time challenging because there's things like recruiting partners, uh, working with the existing staff, uh, helping to get the product to scale to meet enterprise requirements. And so all these other things, you know, that are that are I'm doing in the background, uh, it takes a lot of time. So, uh, yeah, five days in, uh, it is exciting. I'm in it for the long haul, and I'm looking forward to what we're going to do together. Well, congrats, Steve. And uh, I want to thank Steve and Stan for coming on the show today. Uh, very educational. Uh, love your approach, uh, and it sounds like your product is solid. Thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge and experience here with, uh, with us and our listeners on Startup Security Weekly. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back, cover startup news for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.